Way before my time, I'm told by my older brothers in the house where I live next door, the Paulus in formation, the seminarians, used to be sent down to that giant mall in Washington, D.C., where all the museums are, all that lawn, the big grass, and they brought with them a soapbox, and they had to stand in a certain corner and start preaching the gospel and talking about the Catholic faith to all people that are passing by, going on their way to work, going on their way to the museums, the shops, whatever. They would be greeted nicely by some, would come and listen a little bit, encourage them and nod. But there were hecklers, they told me, that there were those that came all the time that showed up just to kind of heckle them and give them a hard time, interrupting them. Uh, I'm so glad they stopped that practice by the time I got there at the seminary. That would have been pretty intimidating. But this is what the Paulus wanted to do, right? The formation people, the leaders of the community from the early days have always gone to the open streets in the cities. They've gone into town halls. They went into places called Lyceum, the individual Lyceum, uh, a place where people would give talks and people would listen. So they wanted us to practice that sense of preaching to people who weren't believers and get used to that. And I'm sure it was a very good practice. Uh, so this is kind of what we're talking about in our readings today. Uh, kind of nobodies. Men didn't have a lot of experience being chosen by God to go out and to preach God's word. Our first reading, Amos is defending himself. He's pretty upset with God, you know. Listen, I'm good at my job. What I do is I dress sycamores. Kind of a weird thought, dressing, you know, going around putting dresses on trees. It's not what he does. Dressing sycamores would be someone who went around and trimmed and pinched and did things to make sure that insects were taking over around the fruit. They looked like little figs, the sycamore fruit. So that was his job, and he was happy doing that, content. But God called him out of that, and he has to go and preach this news of God that wasn't welcome news among people who had money and power. He spoke a challenging word, as prophets often do, and like most prophets, he was rejected. So that's the poor fellow there. And then we have the apostles, these guys who were Jesus' disciples following him, which is what a disciple does. Now they're being sent out in his name, which is what an apostle does. And to make it a little worse, a little harder, they're not to have anything with them, really. Not a lot of stuff, right? Just to go out there and preach this news, and you'll be welcomed by some in the town, I'm sure, he says, and many will reject you, and if the whole town rejects you, they won't listen to you, just leave. Go. Go. Shake the dust off your feet in testimony against them. All right. So, again, not professionals, right? Most of them were fishermen. They weren't professional orators. They weren't these great masters of rhetoric. The one exception would be our buddy, Paul, our patron, who was very gifted as a preacher, that Jesus called him after his death and resurrection. Jesus spoke to him and had Paul go forth because he was a great a uh, person of rhetoric, meaning he could persuade people to come around to his way of thinking. As a Jewish evangelist for years, as one who went around the Mediterranean basin and traveled and encouraged Jews to stay Jewish amongst their Greek relatives and Greek friends, 300 years of Greek culture rammed down their throats, having to speak Greek, having to act like Greek people in order to get promoted at work or whatever it was. Imagine how hard that was to do that, to be a Jew living in a Greek culture, which happened for 300 years before Jesus' time. And so Paul is used by God to very beautifully persuade people. But you know the thing about Paul, as he said last week's reading, that there was something about him. He wasn't all that persuasive to some people. He didn't make a great appearance. But you know what made a big impact was his action. The old adage, actions speak louder than words, was so true with Paul. This guy was very impressive. His letters are beautiful, by the way. I mean, that reading that we just heard from the letter to the Ephesians, right? It's very beautiful if you study it, take it home, read it if you haven't done it yet. 
But it really is about his actions. That Paul was stoned, you know, rocks thrown at his head more than once. That he was whipped, that he was beaten, and yet he comes back and comes back. Pretty impressive guy. Pretty, made, pre, pretty good impression about faith to people who were learning about the faith. So what's this have to do with us? I think it's twofold. One is that we are called, all of us, to preach. But as St. Francis always said, and you've heard the quote before, I'm sure, as he said to his little brothers there, preach the gospel at all times, brothers, and if necessary, use words. In other words, your actions should show your faith, and it should make an impact, and it will make an impact on people. And I think that's a big part of us, too, how we act. That makes an impact on people. If we're in the world and act like we're in the world and we're all about the doggy dog stuff and we're all about trying to gain an upper hand, we're about betraying alliances at work, we're gossiping about our own family members or friends or neighbors, if we're doing things that show we're no different from anybody else, how does that make an impact on the world? How is that preaching Christ? How is that showing people that I really have been adopted by God, adopted. I'm God's child now through Jesus Christ, through my faith in Christ. So we really are called to a, a way of preaching all the time. So it does have an impact on us, I think. And then the second part is the side of the listening, being the audience, being the ones who listen to God. Amos heard God while he's in the middle of trimming these trees. The disciples heard Jesus while they're in the middle of catching fish or collecting taxes or promoting an uprising against Rome, whatever it was. They heard Jesus speak to them and they followed him. You and I are called to that same listening, to have that kind of openness, to really hear God speak to us. And that's difficult for us. It really is. In our day and age, we are such a visual society as never before. Human beings have never been so visually oriented as we are in our time. It wasn't that long ago. Some of you are right here in the pews. You remember, like my oldest brothers and sisters remember as children, listening to the radio, not having a television set. And before radio, we listen to people read stories to us. So they sit around, listen. And way, way back in the ancient days, of course, people didn't read so much. You know, a few people could read, but they remembered. They told stories over and over and over. We listened a lot. That is an art form that's kind of hurting today. So we can do our part in listening as well. Dr. Leo Buscaglia, do you remember this name? Leo Buscaglia, he was on PBS years ago. He was the doctor of love, great uh, former Catholic. I don't think he stayed Catholic, uh, maybe he did. But he grew up in the Catholic faith and talked very warmly about his Catholic upbringing and his family. He had a wonderful saying here about how we can be what I'm talking about, being apostles of Jesus. Too often, he said, we underestimate the power of a touch, a smile, a kind word, a listening ear, an honest compliment, or the smallest act of caring, all of which have the potential to turn life around. As Paul reminds us in the beginning of his letter to the Ephesians, God chose us in him, in Christ. God adopted us through faith in Christ. So let us be Christ then. Let us know that we're sent forth to go out there and to be Christ for others.